um, you're aware that this is a documentary called DC Street Jocks Rock the House, and it's about the the street jocks, mobile jocks, club jocks of the 1970s and 80s that came together and really laid out a culture uh, for for black people uh, in in for dance and music and entertainment during that era. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so tell me about Power Limited, the, the Power Limited group, who they are and how they got started in the nightclub business. Uh, Power Limited was myself and four other young men, and we were all in our 20s at the time. And what we used to do is that we used to go out when we used to get out off work. I used to work for Fannie Mae at the time. And my other partner was working for the government and one of them was working for the United Negro College Fund and one was working for Southeastern University. So we used to go to this place called the Philemon. And it was on 11th Street Northwest. That's where, that's where the uh, hotel is now. Okay, um, and we used to go there in the evening and all the girls from C&P that was working at the C&P telephone company, they would all come over. And Bill Lindsay used to work at C&P. Him and Malcolm Beach both used to work at C&P. And we all used to gather there on Friday evenings and we would have our own little party. And we would party there and the guy would let us party there until 8 o'clock because at 8 o'clock that's when most of his clients came in those that were going to come but it was very few that was coming because very few uh, Caucasians were coming downtown uh, downtown at that time was like a ghost town that, uh, around the early 69 and 70 uh, you didn't find very many people at all on the streets I mean, so we gathered there and we split off after a while. Bill and Malcolm went one way, Drake and myself and Gilbert, we went another way. We picked up our partner, Winston. He was, his, he was Hispanic along the way. And when we started, we started out because we wanted to establish uh, a investment club. And that investment club is where we were going to buy stocks and bonds and we wanted to utilize our funds so that we could put our kids through college and uh but uh i think it was drake that came up with the bright idea that well look man this this ain't gonna work unless we find another way to make money and i said well what do you think because it was Drake and I to, that decided to do Power Limited. And then we brought along Gilbert and uh, Winston. When we decided to do Power Limited, we all invested $25 a piece every week from our paychecks. We used to go back to the old philosophy and when your mother say, put away something for a rainy day. My wife tells me that now, put away something for the rainy fund. So we used to take our little $25 and put it away so we could buy stocks and bonds. Fast forward, we decided to say, well, let's start doing discos. Discos, because at the time, that's when, if, I, if you will, White people knew how to hustle. And when they knew to start hustling, that's when the discos popped off. And we were right in right in right at the beginning when disco began. That was when they had the hustle. And that's when they had all of the the bulbs and the lights and and, and, and white folks was going out every night, you know, that's when they started going out. So we decided that we were going to find some place that we can do a disco. So we said that, well, let's go to some of these hotels, some of these restaurants that are closed that are not doing business. I said, I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. 
because folks ain't going to receive us like that. Well, Drake said, well, uh, we, we'll try this Chinese restaurant, which was the Empress at the time, and that was 1875 Connecticut Avenue. We went in and we spoke, spoke to Mr., um, I think his name was David Lee. Mr. Lee had a son who was around our age. And he was a young guy and he was managing his father's business. So he convinced his father <clears throat> to allow us one night to have discos. We didn't know how it was gonna work out. So what we did is that we bought flyers and we stood down on 13th and F, 12th and F, all downtown handing out flyers. That was the, the only way that we could generate some advertisement rather than going on the radio because we didn't have enough money to buy spots on the radio. So what we did, we passed out all during, uh, during the time, it was probably at noon time most, most, most of the time because we had, not only did you have street jobs, but you had a lot of people that were selling stuff on the streets that was down on F Street, 10th and F, 12th and F, all downtown. And we would wait for the, the, all the young ladies to come out of the government buildings and come out of the, of the, uh, the CNP. We used to pass those flyers out. So what we did is that we opened up the Empress, and at the, that first night we opened up Empress, we got 300 people. How we got 300 people in there, we still don't know. But what we did, we had a 700, Mr. Lee, we had, I think we had a $650, no, we had a $750 bar guarantee arrangement. Um, now, I'll tell you what that bar guarantee, that meant that uh, if we did not generate $750, on that night, then what's the, the difference would be we had to pay him. So we would see his receipts every night, and lo and behold, the first night, we did not make our $750 guarantee. So he would take the, the bar and we would take the door, but we came up short on the door sales for on, on his side. So we ended up paying him $100 or $200, but still, we made far, far more than that because we was paying what? We was charging $3 at the door. Yeah, it was $3, thinking that. I'm trying to think if we was at $2, but I do know we were charging $3. Matter of fact, I don't think that we charged anything more than $3 at any one time. But what we did, we did charge $3 at the door, but we ran that this code at Mr. Lee's for maybe about a year or a year and a half. But guess what? Malcolm and Bill came along. That's Malcolm Beach and Bill Lindsay. And they came along with fire because we were power. And they would take Friday, Saturday nights and we would take Friday nights. I said, I can't, we can't do this. They're gonna be here Friday night why didn't they let us do Saturday night? So we could have two nights. So we went out searching for other venues, other restaurants that would allow us to come in and promote the discos. At the time, we didn't know anything about leisure entertainment because that's what it really is, leisure entertainment. We went to, we got an invitation to meet with Mr. Ulysses Auger of Auger Enterprises. <clears throat> Auger Enterprises owns the uh, Marriott Hotel at 22nd and M Street, and that's when we began to utilize his facilities at the Beret, no, the Black Crystal. And that was the first Blackie Auger Enterprise that we used. But we did use the Black Tahiti, the Black Greco, and the Black Beret. 
all of those. We, all of those Blackie facilities, we use. Bill and Malcolm them did not use it. That's when they created Foxtrap. Now, Foxtrap was a different kind of venue. They catered to the pseudo intellectuals, and we just catered to our folk. And our folks was those people who was the clerks, the janitors, the mechanics, the nurses, aides. Those folks wanted to go places too. They, they, so we said, we'll red, roll out the red carpet to them, you know, because those are our kind of people, and those people are going to stick with us. Those folks that was at Foxtrap, we knew was not going to stick with them because they were transited folks. They were folks that came here to go to college, and after they go to college and stay around here for a little while, they were going to be leaving to go to New York, Chicago, Boston, and all these other places. So it was a nice little run for uh, Bill and Malcolm at the Fox Trap. And I, I used to go to the Fox Trap. I mean, I had me a Fox Trap card. But I always go on Wednesday. The problem was we were utilizing someone else's facility. But Bill and Malcolm, they owned theirs. And they had their liquor license. And that's what made the difference between us and them because they had their own. We did not have the resources to be able to own our own so we kept on leasing and buying and renting from other restaurants that would allow us. But we stayed with the Ulysses Arbor throughout the 70s and part of the 80s. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I need you to list the names of the clubs again. And I'm going to first tell you what you put on here. You had put the Empress, the Black Crystal, the Black Tahiti, the Black Greco. Yes. Um, L.A. Cafe. Now that was a partnership with Bill and Bill oh, okay, and Malcolm. I see that. And um, uh, the Senator Theater. Yes. Teenagers and Calorama Skating Rink. Concert. Yes. So I, if you can remember, just. Just uh, say some of the some of the clubs, because uh, you don't have to mention all of them, but the you know the the most popular, the biggest ones. You know, um, if you if you could just list them for me, so you can start out saying uh, the clubs that Power Limited had were. Okay. Yeah, uh, basically we operated uh, the 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 beret. Hold on one second. That I need you to say, and I'm, I'm just trying to frame your question so I can put it in. I mean, frame your answer so you can say the clubs that we ran. Okay, and then you can start listing. The clubs that we operated. Those clubs were the Beret, the Black Crystal, the Greco, and the Black Tahiti. Those were the nightlife, those were the discos that we we operated. The other venues that we used to operate, those things such as um, the presidential arms. Nobody knew that we operated the presidential arms, but we booked weddings and we booked parties. We booked anything that was not, that had large, large groups. And we had that arrangement with none other than Mr. Theodore Hagen. Ted Hagen gave us, a, gave us a management contract to operate the presidential arms under an agreement for which I don't know whether he had the right to do it, but he did it anyway. And he thought that we were the smartest little businessmen that he could find because Ted would not. Ted would, would not was a, a a man who would fight you for twenty five dollars just like he would fight you for twenty five thousand dollars. I mean, Ted was the entrepreneur of entrepreneurs. 
That's why he has Fort Lincoln. And he used to take us to his uh, uh, his mansion that Fort. That, that's when people were going to Fort Washington, and he had a mansion at Fort Washington. And he used to invite us down on the weekend and talk to us about how we need to do business and this and that. He took us under his wing and told us a lot of different things about how we need to start out doing other things other than other than discos because we were making we were making a lot of money doing it. So he was trying to diversify what we were doing. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned um, okay, you mentioned you did that one. Um, were there any of the clubs that no, or the, I'm sorry, repeat that. Were there any of the restaurants that would not talk with you or were reluctant to have you come into their uh, uh, venues um, or locations uh, to have, you know, have yeah, you have they, they were, yeah, they were those. I mean, we could, we tried to go into the Palm, you know, but they was reluctant. We tried to go into Duke Ziebler, they would not, you know, allow us to. Uh, the, the the steakhouses on K Street, uh, they was reluctant. Um, and some of the Chinese uh, facilities that was on K Street uh, was sort of a reticence about us going, you know, doing, even though that they were not doing any business on Friday and Saturday night. They had a place that they could allow us, but they just felt as though that they did not want that. They thought, the, 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 the problem was that they thought that there were gonna be some risks in terms of uh, property risks, things like uh, broken windows and things of that sort. They, they just felt as though, well, when you got large crowds in our restaurants, you know, what happens when something happens, break out, but, we had a clause in our uh, agreement with uh, Mr. Auger that we would, we, he, he had us to give him a uh, insurance, uh, a, 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 a policy. And we had an insurance policy that covered his restaurants during the times that we were there. Mainly we operated on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. And on the holiday weekends, we had Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sundays. And on Christmas and New Year's, we had New Year's Day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, that was the bomb, uh, was New Year's and Christmas. That's where uh, we rolled out the red carpet for everybody. And we made a lot of money doing it. Tell me about the Black Crystal. Uh, you know, uh, what type of... Club, was the, it? What type of the, the Black was Crystal. It? Uh, Hold we on one second. Okay, three, two, one, go. The Black Crystal had four rooms, and each one of those rooms was something different. We had a uh, an entertainment lounge where we had live entertainment. We will always have live entertainment. We had a game room which we had pools and ping pong tables and that kind of thing. And we had the disco room. We also had a relaxation lounge, you know, where people didn't want to be out on the floor dancing and so forth. They could go on the side and just sit down and just have a drink and, and chill out. Uh, but the Crystal had, those four rooms gave us an opportunity to diversify the whole concept of leisure entertainment because we had multiple things that was going on. They had about, I have to say, they had about 3,500 square feet of space, but, but we used to pack them in there. And I think that the first night we went to the Black Crystal was August of 1971. And that night we had 780 or 790 people that came through the Black Crystal. Interesting thing about the Black Crystal is that 
everybody knew where the Marriott Hotel was, but nobody knew how to go down that parking lot and navigate their way all through that parking lot. And I always wondered, how did they find their way through here and come in at, at, the, at the bottom, uh, come through the doors, and there was the Black Crystal. It would have took me a month of Sundays to try to find where the Black Crystal was because it was in the lower level of the Marriott Hotel. Is that me? Leave your phone. <laughs> oh. Your phone vibrate? Mine don't do nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think I think we got that. Um, did uh, sidebar did for you, a minute. Uh huh. Larry, how did you find your way down there? Thanks to work down the street from the club. I said, how did you find your way to, to the crystal, to the black crystal? Well, and like I, said, I used to work down the street, but so I used to hang out over that way sometimes anyway. It, so it we all just park underneath and walk through the uh, um, garage. And you could hear the music. Yeah, okay, okay, you could, yeah. yeah. But I just couldn't understand how, it, it was difficult to find oh, your yeah. way. If you had to come off of Jeff Davis Highway to come down that ramp, to go into that parking lot to find your way to the crystal, that's why I told you I worked at that Marriott. You remember the, the first Marriott? Not the yeah, no, the first Marriott. Twin Bridges Marriott. Yeah, yeah. See, I worked there, so I knew how to get in there. Yeah, road. yeah. That was the hardest well, thing. Don't ask me how I found my way. Yeah. I mean, I, I was I was there maybe about two or three times, but. Did you I know how to was, find your way? I I guess I did. That, that was my that, that was my Because I came by myself. You know. Is so. that right? Yeah. That, that now think about that. Interesting enough, you felt comfortable enough that you could come to the Black Crystal by yourself without fearing that you were going to have a problem. Now, let me tell you what that was about. Because what we did, we cultivated uh, the disco, the disco element in a, to a science because we did not have people with jeans on. You couldn't come there with sneakers on. We had the men to wear neckties. They dressed up to come. We required that because we knew that the ladies, they were coming. They were looking nice. So we wanted everybody, all the guys, we want you to come looking nice. We did not allow drugs, and you couldn't bring your alcohol, and you couldn't bring water. Now I guess you say, why well, they couldn't have no water? No, because you bring a bottle of water, you can go into the club and buy a scotch, and now you got scotch and water. But basically, people came there on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night in their best because we exemplified that. That was what our form, that was our format. You're gonna come looking nice, and you're gonna come being respectful. So, to your point, you felt comfortable enough that you could get out, get off of work or wherever you were going, and you could come to the club, and you felt comfortable enough to go in there and have a good time and go home. Am I right about it? <laughs> you are absolutely right. <laughs> that's what we did. And that's what we did. Basically, that's what we did to each one of, those, each one of <clears throat> our clubs. That's what we required. Um, and I, and, and, I mean, you can still keep rolling, mm -hmm. but um, at the time I had not too long moved to D.C. from New York. And so, you know, I didn't have a lot of friends and mm -hmm. I was trying to find my way around right. D.C. Right. You know, and so, and I was, a, as I told you, I was a club person in New York, so I'm, right. I'm you trying were, to you, find the clubs. You yeah, know. you were going to Viticus and Justine's. <laughs> yeah, I was you going to all, all of them. them. The garage. The garage. You were going over Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. or you were going over the bridge. <laughs> and so um, I, um, you know, so when I went out, I mean, I, somebody would tell me about a club, and I would just go right. because I did. I felt more comfortable going by myself than going with other people that I really didn't know. Right. You know, because I'm not. I hadn't been in D.C. that long. You know, and then I was the type of person I did. 
you know, I, I, I talk to people um, at work, mm -hmm. you know, but I would have rather just gone out by myself so that I don't have to, I don't like being around a lot of people where a lot of decisions have to be made equally. I want to do what I want to do. So I may sit with you, but then I'll, you know, I would leave, you know, and go walk around or something like that. But um, I always went to places I felt, and then this is once I went to D move to D.C., I went to places with, that I thought was safe. If I talk to somebody on my job and say, well, I'm going to Burn Manor, they say, oh, no, you don't need to go there, you know, <laughs> um, maybe not, might not be safe, right. you know. So I did have some people who at that time would kind of steer me in the places where they felt that I would be safe. Right. So I don't remember saying to anybody, and that was that's 50 years ago. <laughs> I don't remember saying to anybody that I was going to the Black Crystal. I just said, mm, I'm going to, the, I know I said I'm going to the Black Crystal when I get off of work or I'm right. going tonight or whatever. Right. And I would just go. Right. You know, but so. you felt, but, but my point is, as a manager, the environment was safe. The, the environment was safe because we had security. I mean, I had security mm -hmm. there, but the secu we had. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say this: out of all of the years that I was having discos in in the leisure entertainment business, I never was robbed. I never was abused. Abused. I never was assaulted. I never was kicked, hurt. Nothing. I never, nothing. I could walk around the city with a briefcase full of money and no one never touched me. And you know, that's a tribute to how you conduct yourself and how you carry yourself and how you present yourself. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. So, um, did you, did you use uh, street jocks or mobile jocks or club jocks um, in the various uh, locations that you had? Over the period of time, we used several, I mean, street jocks. I mean, let me, let me say it this way. Ray Valentine and DC used to provide me with my sound, my lights, and my turntables and all of that, the sound, my sound, lights, and basically with sound and lights and all of the other things that we needed for the, for the DJs. Maniac McCloud was the only one that I can remember who was a natural DJ who worked for us. That's where Maniac got started. He got started at the Black Crystal when Maniac started at the Black Crystal, we had him working, doing the DJ, and then Gilbert was DJing, and I was DJing. And we would switch on and off to save money. We, we didn't feel it necessary for us to go out and hire anybody because we already had our in-house people, because Maniac was working for us then. But when we had multiple events, we had to use other DJs. We used... I know we used Breeze on holidays because Breeze had all kinds of stuff going on, but we did use him on holidays. We used Boomer. We used Leonard. Let me talk about Smith, Leonard Smith, uh, Super Jock. Um, we used Tommy from time to time. But Tommy basically, Tommy Hall was basically at the Mark IV, as I can remember. Tommy was at the Mark IV. And I think Tommy was at the room. And I think Tommy was at the classics. We didn't use off and on. All of those DJs at one at any given time came through the Black Crystal at one given time. Now Bill and Malcolm, they used to do switch offs and switch ons, but we had maniacs, so we didn't have to do a lot of switch off, switch it off. We always had a consistent group of DJs. Um we had another DJ that we called the Galloping Goose. Uh, he was a real tall, slender guy, but he was really good, you know. But uh, 
he was not among the street jocks. Uh, we 